Hello there, lovely people. It's Alex from Nintendo Life here, and if you're watching this video, that probably means you want to make Pokemon Sword and Shield harder, don't you? Because, yeah, I mean, I really like Pokemon Sword and Shield, don't get me wrong, but, well, I'm certainly not alone in my opinion that the games are a little touch on the accessible side, shall we say. So if you're a series veteran, you've just heard a whisper on the wind that they're a little bit on the easy side, or, I don't know, you're just a glutton for punishment, well, you've come to the right video. Hopefully. We've got various methods of making the games more difficult. They are all self-imposed rules. It's not like there's some secret thing hidden in the game, because that would be silly. And these are going in ascending order, so from the easiest way to bump up your difficulty to the hardest. There'll also be chapter markers that you can find in the video description, and indeed the top comment, because also it turns out that's important, because uh, description links don't work on mobile, because... Why would they? But anyway, that's more than enough waffling, let's dive right into things. The simplest and most straightforward of all the possible ways to ramp up the challenge is just flat out ditching your starter Pokemon. Grookey, Sobble, Scorbunny, whomever you choose, they're designed to be powerful very early on in the game and be the backbone of your team from start to finish. For their power, they're also really quick to climb the level ladder, and they also evolve fairly quickly all things considered. Dropping them off at the first possible opportunity definitely makes the earlier parts of the game a fair bit tougher. Doing this is as simple as the concept itself. All you need to do is catch a wild Pokemon on Route 1 just after you've been to the Slumbering Weald and add it to your party. Then make a beeline for the Pokemon Center in in Wedgehurst and leave your starter Pokemon in a box to relax whilst you do all the hard stuff. If you're worried you might be tempted to use it in the future and you really, really want to stick to it, then you can just release it and say goodbye to it and temptation forever, or alternatively you could trade it to a friend that you trust so that you can use it again once your adventure is complete. Dropping off your starter may be tough at first, but you'll soon adapt in time. So if you really want to test your wits, you might want to consider using what's called a monotype team. A monotype team is basically a team of Pokémon that all share a single type between them, much like most gym leaders do throughout the series. A team like this means you'll not only have trouble with strong foes that are super effective against potentially your entire party, but you'll also have to think much harder about what moves and Pokémon you choose in an effort to counter this as much as you possibly can. Man. Like this Remoraid using Flamethrower. Although not absolutely necessary, we recommend choosing what type your team will share before you start your adventure. You can either choose ahead of time, or if you're feeling especially daring, you can let the magic of HTML choose for you by clicking the link that you can find in the description and the top comment that says Monotype Team Randomizer. If you do, you'll also be shown a list of all the Pokémon available in Sword and Shield that you can pick from of that type. Aren't we lovely? To start your team, you'll likely have to ditch your starter Pokemon as well as, well, basically like we mentioned in the previous thing. That is, unless you chose or were assigned Grass, Fire, or Water, because they fit the bill. You'll have to take them through the slumbering wield no matter what, but as soon as you're able to catch a Pokemon that fits your monotype team, you'll have to drop your starter off as soon as you can. This can be tricky with certain types, such as Fairy, as they won't appear on Route 1 or 2, and so you'll have to push through until you get into the wild area and start your monotype team from there. One last thing to mention, there are plenty of Pokémon that gain a type when they evolve, such as Rookadi gaining the Steel type when it ultimately evolves into Corviknight. Is it acceptable to have a Rookadi in a Steel monotype team? Well, at the end of the day, it's your call, but in our personal view, it's perfectly acceptable as although it's not Steel to begin with, its final form includes it. And that's what you're going to be using for a majority of your adventure anyway, so go for it, dude. However, there are also Pokémon that actively lose a type when they evolve. For example, Onyx is Rock and Ground type, but upon evolving into Steelix, it becomes Steel and Ground type. For our money, the final evolution is the restriction you should place upon yourself. So whilst Onyx would be fine in, say, a Steel-type team, provided you intend to evolve it, of course, which you should, Steelix would not be okay in a Rock-type team. Having said all that, these rules are 100% self-imposed, so if you want to bend our stipulations a little for any reason whatsoever, you're perfectly free to do so. At the end of the day, it's your choice you're doing this, so you do it however you like. It's time to move on what no doubt a lot of people expected, and rightly so, yes, Nuzlocke. 
That's right, we're in Big Trousers territory now. You may well have heard of the Nuzlocke challenge at some point, and for good reason. It amps up the difficulty of the game so significantly that poor planning can even result in you having to delete your save file. Yikes. The Nuzlocke challenge was created by Nick Franco and named after his webcomic series of the same name. The very basic principles of it are simple. Number one, if your Pokemon faints, you must release it. And number two, you may only catch the first Pokemon that you find in each area, and nothing else. People have naturally evolved upon the ideas of Nuzlocke over time, and there are naturally going to be a few questions with rules as simple as these. What about the slumbering wield? Does it have to be the first overworld Pokemon I see, or the first rustle of a grassy patch? Can I keep my starter Pokemon? Where are the toilets? The list is endless. So we've compiled our own list of Nuzlocke rules specifically tailored for the 8th generation, including some optional ones if you fancy a little bit more pep. So, the following rules are mandatory and must be followed throughout your entire playthrough. Number one, you may choose your starter Pokemon gifted to you by Leon. Number two, you may only capture the first Pokemon you battle in each area. This can either be an overworld Pokemon, a random encounter from entering a grassy patch, a Pokemon you reel in from a fishing spot, a Pokemon that falls out of a berry tree to attack you, or a max raid battle. You may not leave the den of a max raid battle if you do not want that Pokemon, and you must use NPCs rather than other players over the internet or via local wireless. If you fail to capture this Pokemon for whatever reason, be it because it fainted or it ran away, you may not catch another from that area. This rule comes into effect only once you receive the Pokeballs you get from talking to your mum after you've visited the Slumbering Weald for the first time. Each area within the wild area is considered a separate location, so you may catch a total of 17 Pokemon in the wild area, one for each location contained within it. Number three, you may not trade or interact with other users via local wireless or over the internet. This includes the surprise trade option and max raid battles. Pokemon that require evolution through trading, such as Gengar, are exempt from this provided that they are traded back immediately. Number four, you may trade Pokemon with in-game NPCs, as long as the Pokemon they request has been caught in accordance with the restrictions listed in Rule 2. You may also accept Pokemon given to you by in-game NPCs without trading trading, such as Toxel. Number five, you may not use mystery gift or event Pokemon such as Gigantamax Meowth. Number six, you must nickname every Pokemon you capture, including your starter. This will make you appreciate them and bond with them more than you would otherwise. Number seven, if one of your Pokemon faints, you must transfer it to a box immediately and release it. This means you may not use any items that revive the Pokemon either, it is considered permanently fainted and must be released, no exceptions. You may however heal your Pokemon using items such as potions and antidotes. Number eight, you may store additional Pokemon you have caught in boxes to be used if you wish to switch out any member of your party or any one of your party faints, provided they are caught in accordance with the restrictions listed in Rule 2. Number nine, you must have the autosave feature active at all times, and you may not reload a previous save at any time. Each action in game is considered permanent and must be treated as such. And finally, number ten, should all your party Pokemon faint, resulting in a whiteout, it is considered a game over and you must start your entire adventure over from the beginning, even if you have reserved Pokemon in boxes. Well, that's all the mandatory rules that you absolutely have to follow, at least in our view. Again, you can feel free to tweak things as much as you like, it's your choice. But here are a bunch of optional rules and feel free to mix and match as many of these as you like, or you can just flat out ignore them entirely. Again, it's your choice, it's your playthrough. You may not use any in-game healing items to heal your Pokemon. Pokemon. This includes status healing items such as Antidote. You may not purchase additional Pokeballs of any kind. You may only use those that you find on the ground. You may not use any held items with your Pokemon. You may not use the Pokemon Link Box to access your boxes outside of a Pokemon Center. You may not use any items at all besides Pokeballs and mandatory key items. You may not use the Pokemon Camp feature to heal your Pokemon with curries. You may not use the Pokemon Camp feature at all. You may not use Star a Pokemon and they must be released as soon as you have a Pokemon to replace them. You may not use the box system to hold reserve Pokemon. You may not run from any battle. You must use the set style of battle rather than the default switch. This can be found in the options menu. You may not use the move tutor. You may not use the flying taxis. And lastly, you may not Dynamax your Pokemon. Once again, those rules 100% optional. Ignore them if you fancy, it's up to you. But yeah, we told you 
you it was big trousers time, didn't we? <laughs> Nuzlocke is undoubtedly not for everyone, but if you've been looking to get some more challenge in your Pokemon games, you'll uh, certainly find it with this. And there you have it. Those are just some techniques that you can employ yourself in order to make Pokemon a little bit harder. I myself and personally am very fond of the idea of a monotype team, just because, I don't know, I, I find Nuzlocke to be a little bit scary, but Monotype, it adds just enough difficulty in there to really hold my attention. And so if you are looking for that kind of thing and you haven't done a Nuzlocke before, I'd definitely try out the Monoteam, Monotype team. Well done, Alex. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, then why don't you use an unexpected flamethrower from a water type because I was so pleased when I found that out. And be sure to check out NintendoLife.com for all sorts of lovely Nintendo-related content. Thank you again for watching. Bye-bye. Oh.